introduce our lunchtime speaker, Professor Gary Francione from the Rutgers School of Law at Newark. And Professor Francione is an internationally known expert on animal law and animal welfare. He has been teaching animal rights theory and the law for more than 25 years. He's lectured on this topic throughout the United States, Canada, and Europe. He's the author of numerous books and articles on animal rights theory and animals in the law. His most recent book, Eat Like You Care, an examination of the morality of eating animals, was published in 2013 by Exemplar Press, and I believe we have some copies yes. available yeah. of, um, by the registration desk. Uh, he and his colleague, adjunct professor Anna Charlton, started and operated the Rutgers Animal Rights Law Clinic from 1990 to 2000, making Rutgers the first university in the U.S. to have animal rights law as part of the regular academic curriculum and to award students academic credit not only for classroom work but also for work on actual cases involving animal issues. So please join me in welcome Professor Gary Chancellor. Thank you, Maggie. Um, that was Brett. Well, if you were here, I, I will thank you this afternoon. Um, this is the second time I've been at the ball. This, this is the second conference you've had, right? And all right. Um, and this morning, I see I, I had the pleasure of saying hello to David Faber, who, uh, when I was flying in this morning, it occurred to me that it was 30 years ago, roughly 29, almost 30 years ago, that I met David. Um, I was just starting to teach at the University of Pennsylvania. It was my first semester. And there was a um, there was a conference. Was it in, in Virginia? Where was that conference? Day? It was the mist of time. It's the mist of time, yeah, exactly. But but, uh, but we've been doing this for a long time. Okay, what I want to talk about today, and let me let me preface my remarks with um, I, I have a different sort of view about some of this stuff, and I I um, I don't um, like a lot of what I see in the animal movement. Days. Um, which is not to say that I um, in any way question the motivation or the integrity of people who are involved with that. I just don't agree with it. And I'm going to give you some reasons why I don't agree with it. But, um, and I hope that uh, if you disagree with me, that you will be able to uh, engage me as to why you disagree with me. Uh, but um, don't take it personal. Okay. Um, you know, you're talk the, the subject today is talking about what our moral obligation is to animals that we use for food. And what I would like to suggest is that if we regard animals as having any moral value at all, that is, if we regard them as not being things, as having moral value, the issue is not how we exploit them for food, but it's recognizing our obligation that we can't morally justify exploiting them for food. And the argument that I'm going to make is that basically if animals matter at all, veganism is the only rational response as a moral baseline. It's the only thing that we can rationally uh, 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 propose in light of that recognition. Um, and I'm going to make basically four points. The first one is that the use of animals for food necessarily assumes that animals don't have an interest in their lives, that their lives don't have moral value. They don't have an interest in life, or morally significant interest in life. Their lives don't have moral value. The second point I'm going to make is even if we put that issue aside, we still have a problem with the idea that there are various levels of suffering. That even if we assume animals don't have an interest in continuing to live, which I think is crazy, but we'll talk about it. Um, it certainly is a dominant position amongst the, um, the, the movement, society generally, and uh, many animal ethicists. But even if we put that aside and we say that, that the primary interest that animals have is an interest in not suffering, I would like to suggest that using animals for food cannot be morally justified. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is the fact that the, the present animal movement and it's been involved, it's been doing this for a long time. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book about this in 1995 um, uh, because it was starting to go in this direction. But it's now really sort of gone in the direction of uh, animal organizations uh, trying to create a market for 
uh, products, animal products that uh, supposedly represent a higher welfare value, and I'm going to talk about why I think that's a bad idea. And then I'm just going to end with a proposal of why or how we could think about this a little bit differently. Okay. Um, is it okay? I, I move. I, I, is it okay if I move? Because um, I wouldn't do it anyway. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, the use of animals for food necessarily, necessarily assumes that we do not regard animal life as having moral value. Think about it for a second. Uh, we would never say that taking the life of a human being is not a harm. We would, I mean, obviously, if I'm going to kill you, it's better that I kill you without a lot of pain first. But if I sneak into your room tonight while you were asleep and I, I shoot you, uh, you won't, if I do it correctly, you won't feel anything. But nevertheless, I think most of us would suggest that um, that's harming you, that we regard that as, as a harm. Why? Because depriving you of your life is a harm. You have a morally significant interest in continuing to live. You obviously have a morally significant interest in not suffering, so I shouldn't torture you first. But if I don't torture you and I just shoot you, I've deprived you of your interest in continuing to live. Very bad idea. You have a morally significant interest in continuing to live. My shooting you, my killing you even painlessly deprives you of that. We don't think that way when it comes to non-human animals. We don't think that way. We think that if we treat them all right, if we give them a reasonably pleasant life and a relatively painless death, we haven't harmed them. Okay? We have this idea that killing them per se is not a morally problematic thing to do. Okay? Now, where does this come from? I would suggest it is the basis of the animal welfare position. It is conventional wisdom. It's what most people believe. And it comes straight out of the development of the animal welfare movement in the 19th century. I mean, think about it for a second. Before the 19th century, you have this idea that animals don't matter. Why don't they matter? Well, you know, some people said because uh, they're, they're, they're not made in God's image, they don't have souls, etc. But, so they were spiritual inferiors. However, other people said, many other people said, uh, the problem is there are cognitive inferiors. We're rational, they're not. We are self-aware, they're not. We use concepts, they don't. So they're, they're cognitively different. They're, they're, they're mentally different from us. And because of these cognitive differences, they don't matter. They're outside the moral community. They're things we can, we can do with them what we want. Okay? I mean, there's this idea that, you know, that, that the, the, the pre-19th century thinking was dominated by René Descartes. He's actually sort of unique in the history of philosophy. There are very few philosophers who took the position that Descartes arguably took, which was that animals were not conscious at all and therefore had no interest because they weren't sentient. They had no subjective awareness. Okay? And that's a fairly radical position. And there's some doubt, I think, as to whether... I mean, that's the, that's the, the typical thing that you get taught in your undergraduate philosophy courses is that you know, Descartes thought they were automatons, that they weren't, that they weren't sentient, that they had no self-awareness. And, and there are certainly things in De Descartes that support that, but there are also things in Descartes that don't support that. However, assuming arguendo that that's what Descartes thought, he is unique in the history of philosophy because most other people recognize that animals are sentient, but that we could treat them as if they were automatons, as if they were things, because they didn't matter morally, because they were cognitively different from us. Okay? This changes in the 19th century fairly dramatically, fairly quickly, actually, in terms of the history of ideas. This, ha this, this change happens relatively quickly. And what happens is you get a bunch of social reformers focused on issues like race-based slavery, women's or the, the right of women to vote, children's issues and things like that. They're basically progressive social thinkers, people like Jeremy Bentham, people like John Stuart Mill. And they say, hey, look, you know, this idea that animals can't think or they can't reason or they can't use abstract concepts, etc. that, you know, maybe yes, maybe no, but the bottom line is it doesn't really matter because they can suffer, and if they can suffer, that matters morally. So, you know, you get the, the famous quote by Bentham. It's actually in a footnote. 
a very important footnote. But uh, the, the um, footnote on the principles of morals and legislation, where Bentham says, you know, the issue is not can they think, can they reason, but can they suffer? And so he introduces this idea that if animals can suffer, then they're members of the moral community, and we have to treat them with respect. We have to treat them, we, we, we have moral obligations that we owe and that we owe directly to them. This is a revolutionary idea. You don't find this idea in Western thinking, really. I mean, there were some people who suggested it, but basically you don't have it as a, as a widely accepted social idea until the 19th century, okay? So Bentham comes along and says, look, animals matter, they can suffer. Now, Bentham kept on eating them. How did that work? Okay, um, the desire to consume animal products has clouded some of the greatest minds in human history. I mean, it was literally. Um, so, how did Bentham make this work? Bentham made it work in the following way. He says, "Look, animals can suffer, and we have an obligation not to make them suffer, quote, gratuitously. However, it's okay for us to keep on using them because they're not self-aware. The cow doesn't care that we eat." Her. She only cares about how we treat her and how we slaughter her. So it doesn't, she's not self-aware. She doesn't, she's not worried about the future. She's not a future, she doesn't think in terms of future. She's not self-aware. Because she's not self-aware, it's all right for us to kill and eat her as long as we treat her humanely. Boom, there is the birth of the animal welfare movement, which we have today. The idea that it's all right for us to use animals as long as we treat them in a particular way, as long as we treat them humanely, as long as we don't subject them to unjustifiable suffering, whatever that means. Um, but you know that that is the basis of the animal welfare movement that we have today, um, and and it the idea that animals are not self-aware. You can't say, well, you know, Jeremy Bentham, that was like several hundred years ago, and who believes that now? The answer is most of us do. It's part of conventional thinking. It even appear, I mean, it's the basis of Peter Singer's views. I mean, he believes that non-human great apes and dolphins and, and, and elephants, um, you know, they, they may be forward-looking beings, but by and large, um, you know, animals that we exploit on a daily basis for food, those animals are not forward-looking beings, particularly chickens. He's this thing about, he's that real prejudice about chickens. But, you know, he really believes that chickens are not forward-looking beings. And so, therefore, killing them, per se, is not the harm. The problem is making them suffer. Okay? So we have, you know, the conventional wisdom is it's all right for us to use them as long as we treat them and kill them in a particular way. That idea is conventional wisdom. It's part of the animal, uh, uh, the, 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 the animal welfare concept. And they're really the only difference between the, the conventional wisdom and the animal welfare position and Singer is a, is a question of degree. Singer thinks we need to do a lot more to treat them, quote, humanely. But he's not opposed, and in certain ways, can't, as an act utilitarian, he arguably can't be opposed to their, their use institutionally. It's not that he thinks that, that, that killing them per se is the problem. The problem is they have interests, particularly an interest in not suffering. And so if we make them suffer, that's bad. Um, and so we ought not to, you know, we, we've got to take that seriously. But killing them is not a, per se, a, a morally significant problem. Now, I think that that's just wrong. I think it's wrong and I think it's speciesist. I think what it does is it assumes that the only way to be self-aware is to be self-aware in a human-like way, okay? To, to basically, you know, uh, uh, how, I mean, we use language, right? I mean, the basis of our concepts is language, right? So, so we are the only animal that uses symbolic <coughs> communication. You can, you know, you, uh, you, you can arguably teach it to some animals, uh, although some people dispute that. But even assu assuming that you can, they don't use it. It's something that you can stick them in a laboratory and, and get some behaviors which indicate that they may be using it. But it's not something they use. We do, okay? This is, this is how we communicate. We communicate symbolic communication. And, and the symbolic communication um, is linked to all these concepts in our heads. And, and so, you know, I mean, obviously, we have a, a, a particular sort of self-awareness, at least those of us who are normal, uh, have a particular sort of self-awareness, okay? Which I would suspect that non-human animals don't have. I mean, I don't think, I mean, we have five rescued dogs. I don't think that they sort of sit around saying, well, you know, I'm eight, you know, I'm really lucky if I get to 16, um, you know, and I got, there's some things I want to do in that time. I mean, I don't think that they think in that way. But the idea that animals are not self-aware, 
or that they don't have an interest in continued living because they don't think in terms of it's my life and I've got this amount of time left if I'm lucky um, and you know my genetic makeup is such that you know I might get this disease or that they don't think in those terms okay so therefore they don't they're not self-aware in the way that we're self-aware now I am I am um, I am um, quite prepared to say animals don't think that way. So what? The answer is so what? Who cares? Does that mean they're not self-aware? Of course they're self-aware. Does that mean they don't have an interest in continuing to live? I want to present a logical puzzle to you. It would seem to me to be the case that what is sentience? I mean, what is sentience? Sentience is a characteristic that certain beings develop which help them to survive by sending messages to them that certain things are noxious and dangerous to their continued existence. So to say that a being who is sentient, by which I mean, there's nothing mystical about, self, about sentience, it's basically subjective awareness, perceptual awareness. The idea that we say that, that um, you can be sentient but not have an interest in life is like saying you can have eyes but not have an interest in continuing to see. I mean, I mean, is that not, would that not be straight? If I said to you, well, you know, we have eyes, but like, you know, that doesn't mean we have an interest in continuing to see. It's, it's something that we have, that we use, that is important to us, and that we have an interest in using, because it is a part of what we are. Similarly, to say that a sentient being doesn't have an interest in continuing to live is just, in my judgment, I don't, I'm not even sure I understand what it means. I understand that it means that, a, that, that my dogs don't sit around saying, well, you know, I mean, gee, I'd like to see Morocco. I've never been in Morocco. I mean, I, yeah, I, I understand that. But I mean, to say that my dogs don't have an interest in continuing to live is, in my judgment, just, um, I, I, it's crazy. Um, I mean, and also there's this idea that, you know, there was a great pathologist, he's dead now, Don, Donald Griffin. He was a really great guy, too. Uh, at Harvard, and he had written a book called Animal Minds. He wasn't an animal rights person. He was a, he was a cognitive ethology, a biologist who focused on cognitive ethology. And what, 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 thought, what uh, Professor Griffin said was that, you know, we think that animals aren't self-aware, but they're, you know, they're, they're perceptually aware when they're out, you know, doing what they're doing. They see other animals, and they realize that those an other animals that are running up trees and stuff are not them. They're not running up the trees. And that he, he said that there was a certain sort of arrogance in, in human beings, which is like, that's a very typical characteristic of our species, but that um, there was a certain arrogance that um, we deny self-awareness to animals because they don't recognize themselves in mirrors and, 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 you know, and things like that. So what? So I want to suggest that this idea that, that really is the foundation of... Um, the animal welfare position and conventional wisdom. This idea that um, animals don't have an interest in continuing to live, so killing them is not the problem. The problem is the suffering. Um, I, I think that that's wrong. I think it relies in a speciesist way on a particular form of human-like self-awareness that I do not believe can be justified. I don't think, I've never seen a good argument for why that, that position works. I don't, I've never seen one, I've never heard one. Um, I mean, I've heard what people say is, well, but if you're a human being, you have, you know, you have, uh, for, you know, you look forward to things. My dogs look forward to things. I take them for a ride every day. Um, you know, if I don't take them for a ride at a particular time, they start annoying, you know, they come over, they start, like, you know, doing things which they know will annoy me and disrupt me. They begin to bark endlessly um, and things like that. They clearly look forward, they clearly look forward to things. Obviously, they look forward. I mean, you know, and think about this for a second, you know. There are people who are mentally disabled who don't really have a sense of the future. There are people who are not mentally disabled but who have forms of amnesia where they don't remember anything in the past and they don't really plan for the future, but they have a very, very strong sense of themselves now. Now, is that relevant? Would that, would that cognitive difference be relevant? Well, yeah, you know, if you're going to like, you know, if DePaul's going to hire a history professor and the choice is between someone who's got, you know, amnesia and somebody who doesn't, then I guess, you know, you're probably better off hiring the person who doesn't have amnesia. But if the question is different, who are we going to use as a forced organ donor? Who are we going to use as an unconsenting subject in a biomedical experiment? 
The idea, I mean, we wouldn't use either of them. We wouldn't use the, the, the normal person or the person with, with amnesia, okay? I mean, if someone's mentally disabled, is mental, mental disability relevant? Yeah, if somebody's really mentally disabled, you might not let them have a driver's license because they might not be able cognitively to deal with traffic issues. But I mean, if the issue, if the question's a different question, you know, who do we give the license to? The person with, with a mental disability or the, the, the quote, normal person? That's one question. If the question is, well, by the way, who do we use as a non-consenting or non-consenting subject in a biomedical experiment or as a forced organ donor? The normal person or the person with mental disabilities? I would suggest neither. Neither. Because they're both sentient beings. <coughs> they both have an interest in their lives. Though the interests may differ, but they both have an interest in their lives. Okay? And a morally significant one, and I don't think you can say that the mentally disabled person doesn't have an interest in life because the interest in life is not the same as, it, as mine is. That that person is not self-aware because his or her self-awareness is not the same way mine is. Okay? Um, but look, even if this isn't the case, even if it's not the case, even if animals don't have an interest in continued life, okay? Let's assume they don't. Let's assume that animals only have an interest in not suffering. Okay? Okay? Let's assume I'm wrong on that first point. I would still suggest we cannot justify eating animals even if we think it's all right to kill them. The reason is, however you, however happy, however wonderful we, we raise animals, however humane it is, and I don't believe, I think that's a fantasy, but however humane we think it is, the bottom line is it's going to involve a significant amount of suffering under the best circumstances. Under the best circumstances, it involves a tremendous amount of, su of, of suffering. I mean, I hear people talk about cage-free. I've been to cage-free facilities. I have to tell you, you know, conventional, conventional cage, enriched cage, cage-free, basically it's torture. Are there differences? Yeah, there are differences. Are they significant? I wouldn't say so. But then again, no, I don't know. Neither does anybody else, either. Okay? But the bottom line is, you know, is it better to torture less than more? Sure. But that doesn't answer the question as to whether it's okay. And so what I would like to suggest is that if we regard animals as having morally significant interest, and a morally significant interest in not suffering, we're committed to veganism. Why? Think about it. There is a moral intuition. Everybody in this room, I, 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 and I feel totally confident, I would bet large amounts of money that no one in this room will gainsay that we all agree that it's wrong to inflict suffering or death on a sentient being without a good reason. We may disagree on what constitutes a good reason. But you know, instructive in this context is my old friend, Actually, I've never met him. Um, but my old friend Michael Vitt, the gift that keeps on giving. I've not, not only not ever met him, but um, I have never watched a football game in my entire life. I hate organized sports, and I hope to leave planet Earth without, without ever seeing one. I just, I just don't. But so I know, he, as a matter of fact, I, I know he played football because he plays football because I was told that. But. Um, <laughs> but I've never seen him play. However, he, he is the gift who keeps on giving as far as I'm concerned. In the following way, Mike Vick was busted in 2007 because he was running a dog fighting operation in some property here in Virginia, okay? It's now 2013. You, you still cannot see a mention of Michael Vick anywhere on the internet without animal people you know, piling on top and saying, evil, bad, horrible, kill him, you know, blah, 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 blah. He shouldn't be playing football, he shouldn't be living, he shouldn't be breathing, he shouldn't, whatever, okay? People despise Michael Vick. Why? Why? What he did was wrong. Why is what he did was wrong? I mean, are we going to be that superficial and say, just because it was dogs? I mean, I mean, that's pretty superficial. If that's your answer, don't tell me because I'll think you're superficial. <laughs> but the reason, the reason why we think that what Mike Vick did was wrong was because he imposed suffering and death on animals and he had no good reason. He just enjoyed it. It was something he got pleasure from. 
And even though we might disagree about the circumstances under which it's all right to inflict suffering and death on a sentient being, I would say absolutely not, even if it's going to cure human illness. I mean, I'm totally opposed to the use of animals in vivisection. You might say, hey, look, you know, if really it's really going to, going to solve, you know, if really going to solve a problem, I would say that's okay. So you and I may disagree on that, but we would both agree, even if you think some forms of vivisection are okay, and I don't, we would both agree that it's wrong to inflict suffering and death for reasons of pleasure. Because you know what? If you don't accept that limitation, then the rule that it's wrong to inflict suffering and death without, without a good justification is meaningless. I mean, if I say to you, look, you know, I think it's wrong to inflict suffering in, 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 on children without a good reason, but I do like to hear them scream. Um, so, so that justifies it. You would say, well, gee, you know, that's an exception which has now created, I mean, you've now created an exception that you can drive a truck through and the, the, the rule is meaningless, okay? Um, but the problem is, when it comes to animals, we're all Michael Vick. That, that's actually the, the thesis of the, the book that Anna and I just did. Um, is that the, 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 the my, as, far as, as far as animals that we eat, we're all Michael Vick. We eat 58 billion land animals a year. You know, do you know how many animals that is? 58 billion. A billion is a thousand million. And I'm pretty good with math, but you know what? I can't get my head around that. That's, a, that's an extraordinary number. And we don't even know how many sea, sea animals we eat. I mean, the estimates are basically a trillion. And everybody agrees that's like a very conservative, a million million, okay? So everybody agrees that's a very, very small number. What's the best justification we have for that? They taste good. We don't need to eat animal products. I mean, I have been a vegan, this is now my 32nd year. I got more energy than most of my students who are now young enough to be my grandchildren. Um, and, and, um, you know, and I can't remember the last, I mean, you know, we don't need this stuff. We don't need milk, cheese, meat, fish to be optimally healthy. Indeed, mainstream healthcare people are telling us that, that animal products are detrimental for our health. But you know, and, you know, the studies seem to show that, but you don't have to buy them. I mean, the bottom line is there, there is no evidence, no empirical evidence out there that you need animal products to be optimally healthy. So that's all you have to accept. And that seems to me to be rather uncontroversial, okay? Um, so the bottom line, I mean, even the American Dietetic Association, which is like not known, you know, it's not like a, you know, it's not a communist organization or something, you know, that, I mean, the American Dietetic or, uh, uh, Association says that a vegan diet is perfectly healthy for everybody. Old, young, pregnant, pregnant people, people involved in physical, build, you know, bodybuilding stuff and in sports and that sort of stuff. And there are all these vegan bodybuilders and stuff. They have rippling muscles and stuff like that. You know, lots of ripples and... <laughs> but, um, okay, so, so um, the bottom line is we kill 58 billion animals, land animals a year for food, and, and an, an unfathomable number of sea animals. And even if you say, well, you know, clams and oysters are not sentient, I don't know whether, I don't eat them, but I don't know whether they're sentient or not. I suspect that, I mean, I err in favor of not eating them. I don't know whether they're sentient. But certainly shrimp and lobsters, I mean, the idea of people say, well, you know, are lobsters sentient? Have you ever seen one boil? The behavior is such that you can't really sort of deny. I mean, it's sort of hard um, not to not to not to say that. And there is now evidence that they are such, and there has, there has been evidence for a while. But the bottom line is, we're all Michael Vick. We, I mean, what the hell's? I mean, you know, Michael Vick like sitting around a pit watching dogs fight. The rest of us like sort of sitting around the summer barbecue pit, roasting the corpses of animals that have been every bit have treated been treated every bit as badly as Michael Vick's dogs. Probably worse in some cases. And the best justification we have, they taste good. So I would suggest, now, now, if it is the case that we are inflicting any significant amount of suffering on animals for reasons of pleasure or amusement or convenience, I would suggest that, in, that is a statement that we don't regard animals as having moral significance because that runs afoul of the intuition. There are very few moral intuitions we all share I'm a moral realist. I believe that there are certain things that, you know, there are certain moral propositions that are as true as any empirical proposition. Um, one of them is it's wrong to inflict suffering and death without a good reason. And that pleasure, amusement, or convenience can't just, can't, can't suffice as a good reason. Okay? So 
what I would suggest to you is that if we are inflicting, putting aside whether killing them is a bad thing to do, putting, put that aside. I would suggest to you that if we really think that animals matter morally, the idea that we can inflict suffering on them, and however humane it is, it will be significant. However humane it is, it will be significant. Particularly, if, if, however humane it is, any commercial uh, production of animal foods will inevitably involve a significant amount of suffering. Okay, um, so just that's not, that's not controversial. If we think it's all right to inflict suffering and death on animals for reasons of pleasure, then we can't say we regard them as members of the moral community. That's hypocritical. It's, it's incoherent, actually. It's, it's incoherent in a logical way. It's hypocritical in a moral way. You can't say that you regard children as moral beings, as members of the moral community, as beings to whom we have direct moral obligations, but it's all right to torture them because you like to hear them scream. No different when it comes to animals. The idea that it's all right for us or that we can regard animals as having moral significance, but that we can subject them to any significant amount of suffering because they taste good or because it's convenient to eat them. Stop, get a burger on the way home. Or, you know, it's what we do at Thanksgiving time or any number of useless, meaningless excuses. Um, suggests, no, it doesn't suggest. It states that the idea that animals matter morally and that we're really concerned about them as moral beings is hypocritical it's a moral, in a moral sense and incoherent in a logical sense. The third point I want to make um, is that you know, a good chunk of my work is focused on this uh, idea that because animals are properties, as a matter of fact, this is what I started doing a zillion years ago, was writing about animal welfare and saying that, you know, animals are channel property. They don't, they don't, have, any ex they don't have any intrinsic or inherent value. They only have extrinsic, external value. And so we will only protect them when we get benefit, generally a, a financial benefit from doing so. And, um, and so, and, and, and that the, the level of animal welfare will always be pegged to what I call efficient exploitation. That basically will provide, we will provide that level of protection for animal interests for which we get a, a for which we get a, a benefit, okay? Uh, we, we don't do it for them, we do it because we get a benefit, generally a financial benefit. So, you know, the, the, the classic example, oh, there's like 30 trillion of them, but the, the, the best example is the Humane Slaughter Act of 1958, okay? That where, where large animals, you know, the, the cows and, and pigs and the calves and whatnot, you had to, unless it was uh, kashrut or halal, you had to uh, stun them and render them insensible before they were shackled, hoisted, and cut. Now, if you look at the legislative history, what you see is um, plenty of evidence that Congress actually explicitly relied on saying, that you know, when you got an animal hanging upside down, large animal, they move around in their conscious. They move, the pelvis breaks. They move around a lot. They they bump into workers who have worker injuries, who have carcass damage. This is not a good thing. We ought to. It's it's better to render them insensible, and it's also the economically good thing to do. What I basically argued in my first book, um, Animals, Property, and the Law. Uh, was that if you look at the history of animal welfare reform going back to England, you see that most animal welfare reforms fit that paradigm, that the only time we protect animal interests is when we recognize that some form of animal use or some, some form of animal treatment is economically inefficient. We're not behaving rationally and efficiently, so we'll shore up the system and we'll provide some protection that will then make the use economically rational. Okay? Um, I would suggest that there are really very few instances of animal welfare reform in the history of the law that don't fit that paradigm. What concerns me now, and, and actually when I wrote Rain Without Thunder in 1995, I thought the movement was going in a bad direction, although um, not even I was cynical enough to think in 1995 um, that it would go in the direction that it's gone now, which is basically what I call the happy exploitation movement, where now you have animal advocates basically trying to create a market for, quote, higher welfare products. Let me, um, 
This is only my second PowerPoint presentation in my entire <laughs> life. And, 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 um, well, that's really good, Maggie. Um, okay, DePaul University is a place. Of, uh, what? Okay. Well, see, what I'm trying to show you is. No, it's not going to help. No. Brett, Brett, help. Help. Okay, it's not, it's not doing what I want it to do. Make it do that. There it goes. Okay, there you go. All right. This is like my, my local Whole Foods. I walk in, whole organic chicken, whole organic chicken, one ninety nine a pound. Now, apart from the fact that I find it <coughs> tragic, beyond belief, that some little bird's life is worth a buck ninety nine a pound. How sick. Um, and and it's, got a, it's got a thing there. It's got a little, you can't see it, but you can see it here. Global Animal Partnership, Animal Welfare Rating 2, Enriched Environment. So I saw that. I took a picture of it. I went home. What is the Global Animal Partnership? And I find the Global Animal Partnership is... Oh, no, wait a minute. I thought I hit that. No? Oh, okay. Well, I guess I didn't. I guess, you know what? I think I, I took the wrong one. I, I, I did. I did. I did. It's not, it's not your fault. It's my fault. Um, although I'll blame you anyway. Um, anyway, all right. So, um, basically, the Global Animal Partnership has my old buddy, Wayne Purcell, is on, he's the CEO of, of the Humane Society. He's on the board of this thing. Okay? He's on the board of this thing of the Global Animal Partnership that is sticking this happy exploitation label and allowing Whole Foods to sell this with the imprimatur of the Global Animal Partnership with Wayne Purcell and indeed the executive director is Mayung Park of formerly of Compassion Over Killing. Now, what about, this is um, something, Bell and Evans. Bell and Evans sells chicken, dead birds. Here we have Ingrid Newkirk saying, Bell and Evans shows that animal welfare and good business can go hand in hand, and by listening to consumers' wishes, Bell and Evans has set a new standard for the chicken supply industry. PETA saying, praising Bell and Evans, which sells dead birds, saying that they've set a new standard. And I had, if I had brought the right, uh, yeah, I can show you some this is PETA giving Whole Foods a, 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 a market an award. Okay? They also gave an award to Temple Grandin, who designs slaughterhouses. They gave her an award as a visionary. Um, this started in, 1990, in 2005 when Whole Foods came out and said, we want to promote humane exploitation. And they got Peter Singer, that's his signature, we have Peter Singer sending a letter in which he says, we express our appreciation and support for the pioneering standards. The, the word pioneering shows up there. It's not a pilot, but I can send you the letter. Mm -hmm. um, appreciation and support for the pioneering standards that, that Whole Foods is developing. And who signs it? Well, amongst other uh, people, Compassion Over Killing, Farm Sanctuary, Mercy for Animals, Humane Society of the United States, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, Vegan Outreach, and Viva. I got a few minutes, don't I? I know. Did you need a new PowerPoint? Oh, no. Do, oh, no. It's okay. It's all right. It's okay. Brett, okay. can you make it bigger? Make it bigger. Yes, Brett. Make it, yes, Brett. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. Now you can see even better. Okay. Um, and so you can see who signed this. All right? Now, um, my friends in the animal protection community tell me they're not promoting happy exploitation. To which I say, if you believe that, I disagree. Respectfully, but I disagree. And I disagree profoundly. The idea that we have PETA saying, Bell and Evans sets a new standard for the chicken supply industry, or we have Wayne Purcell on the board of the Global Animal Partnership, and we have stickers on Whole Foods, you know, saying, this has got this animal welfare rating, that's got this animal welfare rating, and we've got, give it, we're giving awards to Whole Foods, we're giving awards to slaughterhouse designers, we have the father of the animal rights movement, our father, um, is writing letters 
to John Mackey saying, we express our appreciation and support to say, my friends, that this is not promoting happy exploitation is just wrong. It absolutely is. There is no doubt. There is no doubt. You cannot possibly. And, and you know what? We would never do that. And, and you know, now people say to me, well, you know, but we use animals and don't we, you know, isn't it a good idea to sort of make things better? First of all, I think that these changes and what's going on, they are tinkering at the edges of death. That's all it is. They're tinkering. There are, these changes are not particularly significant. Um, and, and number one, number two, um, you try to sort of monitor them. I mean, look at what's happened in Britain with the Freedom Food label. The RSPCA has the Freedom Food label. And every week, they've got some expose or other of something that's gone wrong in a Freedom Food farm. So when people say, but you know, this stuff's going to happen, so isn't it better to have these welfare reforms? To which I have two replies, okay? One is these reforms will happen anyway. For the most part, for the most part, these reforms fit in my theory of efficient exploitation. Let me give you an example. There is a campaign that is going on, has been going on for several years, trying to pressure uh, suppliers, uh, 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 companies that use chickens, to getting chickens from suppliers that gas their birds in controlled atmosphere killing. Read the papers. Don't take my word for it. Read the papers. They're available on my website that PETA has put out and HSUS has put out about controlled atmosphere killing. And what you see is they're reporting studies in agricultural economics journals that it will be cost effective for the industry to move in the direction of controlled atmosphere killing. I mean, look, if you were starting a chicken slaughtering operation tomorrow, you'd be nuts not to use controlled atmosphere killing. It's a much more economically efficient way. And once the present systems, which involve electric stunning and decapitation, water throat slitting, once, once, those, once, those, once that equipment is expensed out and people get their tax, you know, the, the, you know, get their tax benefits, et cetera, they will move in the direction of controlled atmosphere killing because it's the economically rational thing to do. That's the sort of thing we're talking about. Even these campaigns that, that the folks in the animal well in the animal protection movement are promoting are basically what they're doing is they're working with industry making industry more efficient because remember something factory farming only came into existence in like the you know the 1950s right i mean it wasn't something that existed forever i mean it was it it, it it's something that came in the middle of the last century it is now the case that we're identifying economic inefficiencies. I mean, for example, you know, people thought you could stick a whole bunch of veal calves, you know, if you, if you got, you know, you could stick, stick a whole bunch of veal calves in shoots and you could make a lot of money. What they didn't factor in in 1950 was the idea that if you put animals in a stressful situation like that, they will develop illnesses. People weren't counting, people weren't cognizing the fact that animals feel stress, that they feel distress, and that that causes them, just like it does with us, to get sick. So now they're recognizing, gee, you know, this is, we can, we can take them out of the chute, we can put them in a slightly larger social unit, and we cut down on our veterinary costs. The animal people praise us, and, and we, make, we make more money. We cut down on our veterinary costs, and, and we get to say, we care about animals. And not only that, we have the animal people saying, they care about animals. And that's exactly what's going on. We have a movement now that is in partnership with animal exploiters to make animal exploitation more economically efficient, which is what 90% of these things are doing. 90%. Again, go to my website, abolitionistapproach.com. You can get the papers that PETA wrote. You can get the papers that HSUS wrote, in which they argue. Controlled atmosphere killing, it makes economic sense. I mean, again, you've got Ingrid saying in the comment about Bell and Evans, look, and good business and animal welfare can go hand in hand. That's what this is about. It's about business. I would suggest there's a different way of looking at this. It's not just about business. It's not about business at all. It's about fundamental justice. It's about morality. If animals matter, we shouldn't be doing this stuff. And if anybody thinks that this is not encouraging people to continue to consume animal products, 
I respectfully, I, I don't even understand how you could possibly say that. What, what's the purpose of it? I mean, it, the, the, the stated purpose of this. And why do you think Bell and Evans puts HSUS and PETA and the Global Animal Partnership on their website under the, under the heading, What Others Say About <laughs> Us? Why are they doing that? They're doing that because they want to be able to say that animal people, you can be a member of the animal rights movement just by Bell and Evans' chicken. And that's exactly what's going on. And I would suggest that if animals matter morally, that's the wrong thing to do. I mean, think, and, you know, and before somebody says to me, look, you know, animal exploitation, it's all over the place. Isn't this the best we can do? The answer is no. No. We don't do this with humans. I mean, look at rape, for example. You know, people say, well, you know, rape's legal. So what? So what? It is pervasive. As a matter of fact, study, the, the, the UN just did a study a few months back, I believe it was the UN, um, just did a study a few months back saying rape is incredibly pervasive. So yeah, we got laws against it. So what? It happens to lots and lots and lots and lots of women. So what do we say? Well, it's pervasive, so let's have campaigns for humane rape. Let's, let's make it better. It's a reality, so let's make it better. You know, child molestation. I mean, that's, we have an epidemic of that. So let's have kinder child molestation. Let's, let's have campaigns for rules, you know. Let's, let's make it nicer. Nobody would think, nobody would think that that's an all right thing to do. The only reason why we think it's all right to do in this case is because we've accepted certain species assumptions that animal lives don't matter and that, that it is all right for us to make them suffer when our best justification is that we like the taste or it's convenient. I would suggest that that's, that that's just wrong way of thinking. And I would also say to you, if we had a movement instead of people who demanded justice for animals and said, look, veganism is the moral baseline. We can't justify eating them, wearing them, using them. We can't. And we had a significant number of people who took that position. Because I, there are a lot of people who believe that. And if that was our position, and we didn't partner with them to do Bell and Evans ads, or to send love letters to John Mackey at Whole Foods or whatever, if we didn't do that sort of thing, do you think we wouldn't see welfare reforms? No, you would see an industry that would say, my, we've got to respond to that. And they would respond with the same sorts of largely insignificant welfare reforms that we're seeing now. The difference would be you would not have the animal movement partnering with industry and putting a stamp of approval on it. The last thought I have, not the last thought, but one of the last thoughts I have, um, and then I'll take questions. Uh, I don't know what the time is. I'm happy to do this for all. I do this all day. I'm a vegan. I have endless amounts of energy. <laughs> uh, 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 but uh, the last point I want to make to you is, you know, there was an interesting study done uh, by some, some people at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. Um, and what they, what they concluded was that Using Malcolm Gladwell's concept of the tipping point, they said that if you had 10% of a population, 10% of a population that held a moral idea strongly, it doesn't necessarily mean, or it doesn't mean at all, that, you, that, that the other 90% accept it. But what it means is, if you've got 10% of a population holding on to you know, and, and believing strongly in a moral idea. That moral idea now becomes seriously taken and people start discussing it seriously. Could we get to 10% of the population? I have no doubt of it. And then we could have a serious discussion and we've got to change the conversation. The, we've got to change the conversation for how do we exploit them humanely to what's our moral justification for using them at all? And sort of change, just shifting the, 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 the question. Could we do that? Yeah. Are we ever going to do it as long as what we're supporting is sticking labels on, you know, animal welfare rating level two, enriched environment, or Bell and Evans, setting the new standards for chickens, or giving awards to Temple Grandin because 
she built what she calls the highway to heaven, which is her, her, um, her, her uh, what, what, it's one, one term she uses, to describe the ramp that takes cows in a more peaceful way to the stunning bolt and then to having their throats slit. I think this is wrong. So, um, frankly, we can sit around all we want and talk about what our moral obligations to animals are that we eat. And the answer is, if we, that's, that's silly, it's incoherent, and it's hypocritical. If we regarded them as moral beings and having moral value, we wouldn't be eating them at all. Thank you very much. So just going by your last point, then, yeah. the, reaching that 10% threshold, is there no value then in an incremental approach that, that gradually um, educates the public after 10 or 15,000 years of agricultural production and then gets them to that point? Like say this, people are buying a chicken with a value of two, Maybe in another five years, they don't buy anything less than it's got a value of three or four. Eventually, the point you're trying to make is more palatable to broader range. Of um, I don't think that um, as, a, as a, look, we've had animal welfare standards for like 200 years now, right? And I, when I was thinking about the fact that I made that, met David Favor 30 years ago, it wasn't just a random thought. I was thinking actually in the context of saying, you know, I've been doing this for a hell of a long time, and we, you know what? We're using more animals now in more horrific ways than at any point in human history. I don't think that that way of thinking works. I really don't. I don't think that what you do, I don't think that you get people, and there's no evidence to suggest that, getting people to buy level two gets them to buy level five in 10 years and gets them to be a vegan in 20 years. I mean, frankly, what I'm really interested in doing is, again, changing the conversation, because, because your question, is a question that sort of assumes that we're staying with the same conversation about, well, isn't incremental reform a good idea? Isn't humane treatment a good idea? Doesn't it lead in, the, in this direction? The answer, I don't think it does at all. I think what it does is it confuses the hell out of people and sends the wrong message and it makes them think, I can be a member of the animal rights movement. I'm gonna buy Bell and Evans chicken. And I don't think, you know, look, I deal every day with people who have been vegetarians for 20 years. I mean, you know, and they write to me and they say, you know, I just went vegan. Um, you know, I read your website, I read them something, I read an essay, I heard some interview, blah, blah, blah. And you know, it never occurred to me. I've been a member of this group and that group. No one's ever told me that there's no, that there's no, there is no morally coherent distinction between flesh and other animal products. I mean, the bottom line is animals used for dairy are kept alive longer. They're treated every bad as, a bit as badly as animals used for meat. They all end up in the same slaughterhouse anyway. So like, you know, I mean, there's a horror. I mean, dairy is hideous. I mean, it's really, really hideous. Commodification of the maternal. It really is. It's 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 diabolical in a number of respects. Um, but there is no morally significant difference between flesh and dairy. But yet, you know, you would think that if anybody was going, you know, somebody who became a vegetarian 20 years ago, um, is is it, you know, sh should have progressed along a path. And the answer is they're not going to do that until someone challenges them. And so what I'm saying is, why wait? Life is short. Let's challenge them now. And, and um, you know, I mean, really, I mean, what's, the, what's I mean, I, I, the, one of the reasons why we wrote this book is basically like it, it is, um, you know, sort of an in your face book, which may surprise you about my personality. But, um, <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's sort of a, it, it, the, the book basically says, look, if you care about animals, you've got to stop eating them. And you already believe that, let us show you why. And the response I'm getting, to, the response I'm getting to this book um, is just phenomenal in terms of, a, the number of copies people are buying. And the responses we're getting in terms of the, the, the messages we're getting from people saying, I mean, I, and we must have gotten, this, the thing came out in Kindle in June, didn't come out until uh, in July, actually. Didn't come out until print, until the end of September. When was it? When was it? it was in September. Was it the end of September? <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, it was a long time ago. No, it was a short time ago. And the number of responses we're getting from people of, you know, I've read it, I'm going vegan, and I've been a vegetarian, or I've been thinking about this, and it's never been, the bottom line, we're not presenting it clearly, and as long as what we're doing is putting ratings this and rate, you know, that, that, the bottom line, we're not, that's gonna encourage people to continue to consume them. I think that's the wrong thing to do, and I'm not a utilitarian. I mean, I'm, you know, my view is, look, 
I still wouldn't support humane rape campaigns, even if somebody said to me, well, you know, if we start small and start saying, well, you know, don't beat her too much, you know, I mean, you know, use a smaller stick, uh, you know, I mean, and then eventually we'll get to a no rape situation. I still say, look, that's monstrous. I don't want any part of that. You know, I just want, I want it to be clear. No means no, and you, you know, then rape is bad. However, acquaintance rape, for whatever, is bad. Um, and so I want it to be clear. Um, and so, you know, I'm not a utilitarian in that sense. But I also think it's a psychological matter. There's no reason to believe that that scenario is going to play out. And, and I can tell you this, um, you know, when you've got lots of people who are themselves involved in the animal movement who don't progress to veganism because it's just like the light doesn't go on, that tells you we're not screwing in the right bulbs. Yes, yes. Um, as a, a scientist who now has done animal communication for about 10 years, I'd yes. like to jump in with a couple of things. Sure. Um, notably, uh, it amazes me how often I receive uh, messages in metaphor. So the idea that uh, consciousness uh, is different for human beings is becoming less likely a truth to me, um, but that's just my own experience. There's also a component that occurred uh, long ago in classes where people would sit there and say, I love animals, I want to be an animal communicator, but I still eat meat, and I'm guilty as hell about it. And so there's been a lot of discussion among the communication community, um, and, and what is arising is that animals are cooperating and volunteering for a lot of missions, so to speak, that we would never imagine. And that they do understand that they currently have a place in our food chain, they, they hope for respectful uh, Sorry, their bodies. Okay. There is also a new concept that I never had heard before, where in predator-prey relationships, which, which bothers some of us who love animals, you know, how do we cope with animals, killing animals, and wild kingdom, and the new taken down, and whatever, um, that, that actually the spirit leaves the body sooner than was formerly known, and that animals will often choose to die in this day and age. So there's a lot going on there that, you know, as a scientist, I would have gone, oh, that's, that's absolutely crap. Um, but now it's a, a really intriguing the part of this whole argument is, to, you know, they do have preferences. They do make choices. And people choose. said that the slaves, I mean, people, people, by no, the way, no, no, no. I, but I, there is a literature. I, I know, there is the a next literature. Step, because the next step is oppression, opp the oppressed. Uh, there is a literature that says that, sla that some operate. slaves... Yeah. I'm cooperated saying, and wanted yeah, to be slaves. I, I, I'm just saying that, that there's all kinds of stuff going on with the messages that we're getting from you. Okay, animals. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I... Interesting I okay, I, I really, I mean, I, I don't know much about animal communication. Yes? Professor, how do you see us as attorneys, uh, what would our role be in the abolitionist movement? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, when we ran the clinic, uh, when and Anna Charles and I ran the animal rights clinic at Rutgers, we never did things like, I, I mean, I, I don't, have any interest in drafting wills, you know, that provide for animals or dealing with custody disputes in, in, in divorces and stuff like that. What we did was, we basically, I, I, I fairly early on understood that the law was useless when it came to changing the status of animals, that it would never do that. Um, and, and, um, uh, and for lots of reasons, the law is essentially conservative, it doesn't lead social change, it follows. But what we try to do is we focused on human rights issues that were related to animal rights issues. So that what we were doing is we represented people who, you know, we represented a lot of students who didn't want to dissect their vivisect. Tons of them. God, tons of them. That was like one of the main things we did. We represented prisoners that wanted vegan food. You know, you go to prison, it's easier to get, you know, the authorities are happier for you to have drugs than vegan food. And, and they, they will, they, you know, they give you a hard time. They give prisoners a really hard time about vegan food. So we represented prisoners that wanted vegan food. We represented people. We did some in the early days. We represented people who were involved in grand jury proceedings, who were thought to be involved in direct action, never anything violent. Um, but, you know, were accused of, of, uh, of certain things, uh, and they had a right to, to a defense. Um, and, um, and, you know, we, we, we did, you know, we try, we, like, people who wanted to have a, a, de a vegan demonstration, and the police were trying to charge them $300 for a permit, you know, which is, like, not, they, they're not supposed to do that. Um, or imposing an unreasonable time, place, and manner restriction, stuff like that. So the idea was to focus on human rights issues. And 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 to sort and, and and to to protect and support the people who are out there, do, trying to shift the paradigm rather than thinking of ourselves as as shifting the paradigm. Because I really don't think that that is. This is a system 
Law school, what's law school? It's like three years of property, right? I mean, I mean, really, that's what it is. I mean, whatever you're taking, you're taking some version of property. And, and, um, and so I, I think that um, you know, law, law, the law is there to protect property. Um, we're not going to incrementally eradicate or use the law to eradicate uh, 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 property status. It didn't work with slaves either. I mean, you know, it, it didn't, we didn't have law which, which incrementally eradicated the property status of slaves. We had a paradigm shift, which, which also included a civil war, but we, we had, you know, it, it wasn't the law that result that that caused the shift or a, or a, a, a um, you know caused the dissolution of slavery indeed the law protected it because the law protects property interests and slaves were property what one more question one more question one more question yes who within the animal rights community is shifting the paradigm i mean uh, got me I, look look i think the reality is these organizations they're 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 businesses you know they have employees they've got expenses um, and so I understand, I don't agree with, but I understand the economic incentive that gets them to say, look, you know, let's sell happy exploitation. It sells. The public likes it because, you know, it makes everybody feel that they can, you know, it, it, it makes the person who loves the dog or the cat or whatever um, and, you know, says, I'm an animal lover. Well, then about go buy your chicken at Bell and Evans. So, so it, it, you know, it, I understand how it works. I understand the business model. I've been kicking around for a long time, and I have, I have worked with a lot of these organizations over the years. I don't anymore because I don't agree with what they do. But I don't. I see, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, there are grassroots organizations. Um, you know, I'm one person. I don't have a staff. I mean, I have students that help me and stuff like that, and I have other people who, who volunteer. But I don't have a staff. Um, and you know, we've gone in, in a year on the Facebook site, the abolitionist approach to 26,000 people like in a year, and it was like 5,000. When I was here last year, it was like, it was like 5,000. It's now 26,000. Um, and I can't keep up with, I get like 400 emails. I cannot, I, I could take out my, 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 my phone and I can show you how many emails I have gotten just today since I've been here. It's out of control. There are a lot of people who are interested in this idea. There are a lot of people who are finally getting the idea that this is a waste of time. That promoting this welfare reform is a waste of time. Let's take the time, the resources, the labor, the economic resources. Let's put it into a campaign for unequivocal, clear, not rocket science. If you, you know, if animals matter, we can't eat them, we can't wear them, we can, we can't use them. And let us explain why that's the case. There's an organization, the Abolitionist Vegan Society, that formed recently. Um, that that um, is trying to put together grassroots, you know, it's, it's, it's a grassroots organization and it's trying, as a matter of fact, Sarah Woodcock, who started that organization, is here today. And, and what they're trying to do is put together um, uh, 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 grassroots people, you know, grassroots groups all over the planet. And every weekend she's having this abolition of this, this challenge. She's getting people to go out on the street, table, leaflet, educate. No gory pictures. No, you know, it's, a, it's that, that's really not what it's about. Because you focus people on gory pictures, you might get them emotionally upset. Some people might react, but you know what? You focus them on gory pictures, and then three weeks later, they're thinking, well, the solution is to make it better. So, you know, my view is no gory pictures. Let's just talk. You know, people aren't idiots. I really despise this idea that is rampant in the animal movement that, that people can't understand. It's too radical. They can't understand it. No. No, I absolutely disagree with that. Um, you know, I, I, am, I am not going to be that. I believe people can be educated, and I believe that most people, many people, really do care about this issue morally. They really do. And they do have cats and dogs that they love. And they do value animals. They do regard them as members of the moral community. We just need to explain to them in a better way than we've done before about what that means in terms of our behavior. Thank you very much and thank you for coming.